Hello, 012 group. This is Colonel Gallagher, and I haven't talked too much lately. I apologize for that, but let's get back to World War I, where we last left off. I emphasize the idea that the thought would be it would be a short war, uh, the idea of the three nations, three leaders, three weeks. So let's go back and start with a quote. Uh, if I had not done it, then the Germans would have found an excuse. That was the last words, uh, really, of Princip, who pulled the trigger and assassinated uh, the Archduke. I mean, you got to think on that. If not myself, then the Germans. And so is this true? And so this brings us to another thing, uh, point today. And I want you to think of the letter F, G, H. They go in order. F, G, H. Fear, geography, and halt. Halt. And so the whole idea here is, even though Princip was a member of the Black Hand, okay, um, when you look back at this, it's really the sense of fear, panic. And we've seen this lately, haven't we? Where fear comes out, people panic, and they don't act so rational. Uh, they allow events to control themselves rather than they control events. And this is why when I gave you the reading by Stossinger, um, this is where we get into the idea of men made decisions. The the iron dice must roll, they said. You know, so we're going to roll those iron dice and hope that it comes up. Oh, snake eyes. Hope that it comes up proper for us. Uh, and if you think about it, it's almost like throwing your hands into the air and saying, well, you know, if this is it, then let it happen. And in, in retrospect, when you look backwards, there was uh, perhaps a way to handle this diplomatically becomes the question, was there? Um, with the idea of fear, one of the things that's emphasized, there, and you have to understand, is geographical. That's the G is the map. And when you look at the map, the Germans are in what we call the Franco-Russian vice. They're between France and Russia, and they're smack dab in the middle. Therefore, there'd be this two-front war because France and Russia had an alliance with each other. And so the Germans had to think a way through this. If it does come down, and almost in a way they're talking about the idea that this is going to happen, this is the German general staff. And so they had, what they did is they Instead of the idea of a diplomatic situation, which Bismarck had put in place because he recognized this may happen, uh, the idea of the Germans sign an alliance with Russia because Bismarck knew the Franco-Prussian, if there was going to be a problem, it'd be with France. That kept a one-front war, and this was to then offset any kind of a circular uh, encirclement uh, of the German region. Um, and so once this foolish thing, as they called it, happened in the Balkans and the assassination of Ferdinand, uh, sparked this into this this crisis where the Austro-Hungarian Empire was to supposedly quickly punish the uh, Serbians, and it dragged on for those several weeks. Um, what happens now is the Germans had, 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 in 1905, had put in place something called the Schlieffen Plan, and I'll put the words in for you later. I'll send it to you. Uh, the Schlieffen Plan was the idea of the Germans said, okay, here we are in this Poor geographical location, basically surrounded. We don't want a two-front war, so how do we do this? And it's simplified by saying Paris for lunch, Petersburg for dinner. Petersburg's in Russia. And so the whole idea is lunch comes before dinner. You guys should know this. Uh, I'm going to put it in your terms. DRC and SRC. Okay, right? And so the whole idea is it, you, would, you would attack uh, uh, France first because this is the one that, that would be mobilizing quicker. This is the one you're worried about. Russia's slow to mobilize. We could quickly, the Germans thinking we could beat France out, uh, get a peace treaty with them quickly, and then turn right back around and, and, and put all of our fury to the east. Um, and when you think of this, this there's, there's one problem. Uh, there, there's, when you look at the Schlieffen plan, there's a twist. <laughs> Using my Monopoly board. Uh, and so what we have here is you can't directly go. You can't really do this. This is this big twist. They can't really attack France directly. Uh, France has built up these fortifications on the border. And so the Schlieffen plan then called for going through Belgium, circumventing, going around and going through Belgium. Poor little Belgium, this little neutral country. And and the Germans, you know, did request, you know, the ability to march through. Uh, and, and the Belgian king said, no, I mean, think about it. Well, may we take this army and march through I mean, it would be like if Canada or Mexico wanted to attack each other and they go, oh, we promise we're just going to walk through. <laughs> That's it. Um, and, uh, and then use you as, you know, a little hallway and then we'll get to where what we really want it to be. I allow this massive army to come on your land. They're looking at this going crazy. 
We're not going to allow this. Now, th this is where you bring Britain into the picture because Britain didn't like this idea. Britain and Belgium had a, a, an alliance. It's called the Scrap of Paper. Uh, it goes back to 1830. Uh, and, 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 and it's not so much that alone, but think about this. To, to, the, to the Brits, the Germans we talked about last time, they're building these submarines. They're, 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 uh, they're competing directly with the Brits for their place in the sun. Remember, the, 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 the sun never sets on the British Empire. They don't like them being this close in the channel, and they don't like the idea of what they're going to do to the Belgium. This is too much of a disruption to them in their mind. So this is sucking the British in now, this vortex, this whirlpool that went from a localized conflict. Austria punished Serbia. Uh, Austria even uses the word, we must teach them to fear us again to the Serbians. There's that fear again. Uh, and there's these perceptions that's being built up. And, and, and they're allowing things to get out of control, someone could argue. This is why you go back to Stasinger. Stasinger is one of the men make decisions. Um, and so it, it's now in the hands of the Kaiser and the Germans of the Schlieffen plan is now are going to unleash this idea of attack France. And then you get back to, to Russia. And it's all automated. It's push button warfare is what I would call it. It's all a machine. It's the railways. Railways roll as much as the iron dice roll. And so this is this is the concept. And once the trains leave the station, one of my favorite stories is where the Kaiser then has his second thought, says, wait, can we just put this all off? And and uh, one of the general staff officers says, it's too late, my Kaiser. The men have left the trains <laughs> and turn them around. You know, that's in Stassinger's reading, which is really good. No, it's too late. It reminds me of the, the Marx brothers. You ever know who they were? I don't know if you guys do. Uh, Groucho Marx in, in, a, in a film they make called Duck Soup, where uh, they're fighting, and uh, they, uh, the, the opposition, Sylvania, wants to negotiate, and Groucho Marx goes, too late, I already paid a month's rent for the battlefield. This is kind of that running joke, in a way, it's too late. The H is halt. Now, when you think about it, this is what happens on the Western Front, because of the Schlieffen Plan, and the, the, the large-scale uh, attack, uh, this, this sweeping attack, and they do go through Belgium, and, and, and there's horrible atrocities that come out of this. The Belgians, poor little Belgium. Uh, is, is under the strength, uh, under the control of the Germans, and they're doing these unspeakable acts. People start newspapers, of course, British newspapers start writing about this specifically. And so what happens is they get halted. And, and, and then this lines up this Western Front. This is where you get this Western Front. It's about stalemate. And this already sets the war in place. The war is really about two things when you think of it militarily. It's about stalemate on the Western Front, and it's about Austrian-Hungarian crisis on the Eastern Front. What I mean by that is the Austro-Hungarians, the Germans are always sitting there, you know, kind of, oh, we got to bail them out again. We got to bail them out again. <laughs> the Austrians aren't doing too well, and and they have to deal with this these these massive Russian armies coming, but they're they're not very well prepared. Uh, these are Russian peasants, um, and and they're not so thrilled. They start dying in huge numbers, and at the most famous battle, uh, it's a little town uh, called Tannenberg. Uh, T-A-N-N-E-N-B-E-R-G, uh, the, the Germans have this massive decisive victory. Uh, and, 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 and in fact, uh, there's this mammoth monument that's built to uh, Tannenberg to memorialize it. Uh, and uh, it, in fact, it was just outside of Hitler's uh, main headquarters there, uh, military headquarters, so you could watch this. It's, it's, uh, the, the Russians in World War II, after they come in, you know, get, get rid of this, they destroy this. So, um, you know, I mean, red, you know, revenge is best for old, uh, old war than after that, right? It's a good way to jog into that. So you have fear, you have the idea of geography, and then you have the idea of halt. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be static warfare on the Western Front. The Eastern Front it is bitter, ugly, horrifying. Uh, there's a really good book, but it's more about World War II, but it's just as good. It's called The Bloodlands, written uh, in the British historian who escaped my mind. I think it's Snyder uh, wrote it. If I'm wrong, correct me, please. And uh, that's one of the, the, the key things to the readings, okay, is, is the poor little Polish area over there. Uh, and uh, the final one, if you put an I in here, do the word inevitability. Was this really an inevitable war? And I think when you look back and you read Stoss and Drunsky, this is one of the great questions. The iron dice must roll. Was this inevitable? The inevitability seems to be uh, in the German mind, in the German military mind specifically, um, the, with the staff, the general staff. The general staffs have taken over. Uh, in the Russian mind with Sazanov, remember in your reading, he, he doesn't like the Austrians. He, he finds them detestable. And, and underlying in all this, this nationalism is there. Okay, this, this, this consciousness, uh, this sense of superiority is there. 
Um, and really, when you when you kind of dissect it, this is the creation of that 20th century problem. As my as my mentor and colleague now, uh, but my mentor and shaper of me, uh, Colonel Hitchcock, Ted Walter Ted Hitchcock at the, at the Mexico Military Institute said, "20th century is where uh, racism hijacked nationalism." And you begin to see this. This is not all of a sudden when you get to World War II. Uh, someone's look around going, hey, there's a bunch of Jews. Let's do this. Um, you see it in World War One with the Armenian crisis uh, in the Turks. And, and that's another story. I don't have time. I know it's over 10 minutes. That's why I keep it short, so I apologize. Think of those things, the fear, the geography, and the hope. Okay, and then the I, A-F-T-H-I, the inevitability of war. Um, in the back, reverse engineering this. It's a great lesson. World War One is a wonderful story of what should not happen and you should not let fear run your life and you should not let it uh, get in the way of, of decisions. Okay, men must make decisions. Okay, uh, thank you. I look forward to seeing you again. Uh, here I am courtesy of my own home and in my uniform as I've been asked to do so. I'll see you, thank you.